the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as the grave. Ahaz said, I won't ask. I won't test the Lord. Then Isaiah said, Listen, house of is it enough for you to be tiresome for people that you are also tiresome before my God? Therefore, The young woman is pregnant and is about to give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. He will eat butter and honey and learn to reject evil and choose good. The land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. 801, we're, we're doing Psalm 80, and we will sing response 1. And I invite you to read the bold font as I read the light font, page 801. <laughs> In the presence of Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears. Look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock which your right hand planted. They have burned it with fire. Oh! 
may be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are moving oh so closer to Christmas and our celebration of God coming to dwell with us as one of us. In just one more week, well, I guess less than one more week, if you do Christmas Eve shenanigans, we will open presents, we'll sing our favorite Christmas carols, um, we'll do holiday baking, spend time with loved ones, and if you're like Jared and I, we'll do all of our Christmas shopping, because we've done none. <laughs> Gold. But we are not quite there yet. We still have one more week for us to focus on the coming, the multiple comings, of Jesus Christ. We've been kind of focusing on that presence of Christ through this Advent season. Remember that Advent is only marginally connected to Christmas itself. It's really a season for us to think about and look forward to Christ's second coming, Christ's return to earth. Remember, if you need some trivia points, in Greek that's Christ's parousia, or in Latin his adventus, which both mean coming to be with us. So this is the season we talk about Christ <coughs> coming. And if you remember so far, we've kind of outlined sort of three um, major comings of Christ, or incarnations of God is another way that we might say that. But I'm going to add one more today just to make sure we have in our brain here. This one harkens back to our St. Francis Day service back in October. Remember, we talked about creation as the very original incarnation of God, that God's presence and spirit dwelled with us in the created world. The next one um, that we will talk about, obviously we'll spend the most next week, and that's Christmas, or the nativity, when Christ came in the form of a baby. The third that we've talked about is that commitment that we make. We ready ourselves as a temple for God. Remember I said my, my, my bringing up Jesus lives in my heart, right? That's that kind of coming that we prepare for. And the final that we talked about is the second coming, when Christ returns to earth as the Lord of all creation, ruling over us with mercy and justice and love. However, as we continue to move through this Advent season, it's becoming harder and harder to avoid that imminent holiday in what we're doing and what we're talking about and what we're singing. And the lectionary, which is that assigned scripture text for the day, which is the fourth Sunday of Advent, does us no favors with that help or with that reading from Matthew today, which is quite very Christmas focused. So you'll get just a little bit of Christmas today as we talk about the birth of Jesus and how that comes around. Now, I want to start today by sort of deconstructing a little bit of our general understandings of Christmas, because we've become really normalized to some really not normal stuff. Culture has created a certain aesthetic for Christmas, and with that, a certain aesthetic for love, right? We can all immediately see, when I say, what do you think of when you see love? Hearts and roses, chocolates and fluted bubbly beverages of your choice, sweet tender kisses, right? Even the non-romantic love, that has a certain pop culture vibe. Soft music, gentle lighting, this is too harsh for me, gentle lighting, sleeping babies, right? When we talk about Christmas love, we almost universally see Mary, often a very pale, small friend woman in a light blue head wrap, holding that sweet, precious, little cooing baby who looks to be about six months old, right? <laughs> but Christmas love is so much more than that. It's so much more than just affection or mood or tone. Love is the situation that Jesus was born into. Jesus is love, born into love, God's very present love. In order to see that, though, we have to strip off some of the niceties of the Christmas story. Because what we're doing is equating nice and neat with loving. Nice and neat with love. 
The story that we hear in the Gospels, in general, but especially at Christmas, it's not a pretty story. It's full of gritty stuff, unfortunate life circumstances, social, political unrest, mass murders. The list continues on like that. The people of God in these stories of our faith are often up against what seems like insurmountable odds. So I'm not saying Mary didn't have some sweet, tender moments with baby Jesus. I'm sure she did. But I guarantee that she wasn't dressed to the nines with her makeup and her heels on. She was tired. She was a child herself. We forget that she was probably in her early to mid-teens, no earlier than 14, or older than 14. She was doing hard, messy work at God's request. And Joseph? Well, Joseph was an integral part of this story as well. And he was faced with messiness, just like every other character in our biblical stories. The gospel reading that Mary read today for us portrays Joseph's version of the Annunciation, which is that fancy term for God announcing the baby Jesus to Mary. For Joseph, he learned of Mary's pregnancy, and he had to step away to consider his options. We like to portray Joseph in certain ways, but that one sentence of scripture tells us he really struggled. Mary's family would have been bound by law to reject her if Joseph had chosen to reject her. Because engagements were very different back then than they are now. An engagement, or a betrothal as is often called, was a legally binding contract between the groom and the bride's father. This was when they laid out all of the terms of the marriage. Uh, the dowry, the land, the estates, family business, etc., etc. So Mary would have been considered just marginally above property at this time. Her family owed her absolutely nothing. If she was found to not be pure, they were all well within legal rights and moral code of the time to completely disown her. Jesus would have grown up illegitimate as well. He would have had no standing in society. His life, just like his mother's, would have been ruined. So at first, Joseph says, I don't want to be married to her. So he didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. He said, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to do it quietly. I'm not going to make a scene. I'm not going to throw her under the bus. I'm just going to step away. Our gospel reading noted that he had that resolve to go ahead and just cancel the whole thing, cancel the engagement. But fortuitously, and as God often does, right before Joseph executes his plan, an angel shows up and shares this message with Joseph of who this baby is, where he comes from, and what he'll be doing. It must have been terribly hard, though, for Joseph to just accept what he heard. Conceived by the Holy Spirit, his son Jesus would save people from their sins? How could any of that be true? There's the messiness. Now, here's the love. Joseph, with that same kind of faith that Mary had when she said yes to God, he did. He said, yes, Lord. He said, yes, and he took Mary as his wife. Despite the messiness that's all around it. We don't know much about Joseph's life before this or really even after this, unfortunately. But we know that he loved Mary. And he loved Jesus. We can only see that love clearly when we see just how messy this whole thing was. Now, that's Joseph's love. But I would be remiss if we didn't also talk today about Mary's love. Our assigned gospel for today, Advent uh, Liturgical Year A, is Matthew. So through Advent, we've been reading Matthew. Last year, we were in Luke. And Luke is the gospel that has the really long Christmas story, the nativity story that we're probably used to reading uh, in church at Christmas and with our families around the Christmas trees. But I want us to be able to hear both voices 
Mary's and Joseph's. Hear this reading uh, from Luke chapter 1. When the angel Gabriel came to her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, for God is with you. She was confused by these words, and she wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said, Don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. He will rule over Jacob's house forever, and there will be no end to his kingdom. Then Mary said to the angel, How will this happen, since I haven't had relations with a man? The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come over you, and the power of the Most High God will overshadow you. Therefore, the one who is to be born will be holy. He will be called God's son. Then Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me just as you have said. Then the angel left her, and Mary got up and hurried to a city in the Judean highlands. She entered Zacharias' home and greeted Elizabeth, her cousin. Mary said, With all my heart I glorify the Lord. In the depths of who I am, I rejoice in God my Savior. He has looked with favor on his lowly servant. Look, from now on, everyone will consider me highly favored, because the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is God's name. He shows mercy to everyone, from one generation to the next, who honors him as God. He's shown strength with his arm, he scattered those with arrogant thoughts and proud inclinations. He's pulled the powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He's filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent empty-handed away. He's come to the aid of his servant Israel, remembering his mercy just as he promised to our ancestors, to Abraham and Abraham's descendants forever. That's not neat. That's not nice. That's not tidy. In fact, that's quite messy. In that canticle or biblical song, Mary talks about God's strength, smiting, think about the Old Testament, scattering the arrogant, pulling people off of their thrones, casting out the rich. None of that is something I would associate with loving or nice and neat. But yet, through all of that messiness, we see love coming through, God's very present, all-encompassing love. Mary says he's come to the aid of his servant, remembering his mercy, just as he promised with our ancestors. God's love despite all of the messiness that's come in between, has held us since the very beginning of creation. Through the world's dirtiness and messiness, God's love always shines through. Nice and neat isn't always love, and love isn't always nice and neat. We have one more week of waiting. Just one. One more week of preparing ourselves for any number of those comings of Jesus Christ. Are we looking to his return, his second coming? Are we excited? Do we see it with zeal? Are we preparing ourselves by loving our neighbors, serving the needs of the poor, the destitute, loving on the outcast, the oppressed? Are we even ready to welcome God in baby form? We have work to do. Remember, Advent isn't that time of passive waiting, but active waiting. A time to sort of reinvigorate that love that we have for ourselves, for others, for God, for the created world. Just like in our song, that refrain you noticed that came back three or four times, 
Restore us, O God. Restore us. In this last week of Advent, I want to challenge you to hold on to Advent. It's a little bit longer, but hold on to it. And find those places where you can plug in and you can serve others intentionally as we move through this holiday season. Through the messiness of our world, our lives, our jobs, relationships, addictions, temptations, all of that, may we allow God's love to just shine through it. That Christmas love that is so pure and so special, it can be alive in us through Jesus Christ. If we just step out of the way and let God's Holy Spirit do the work in and through us, we make that offering of ourselves for God's very present love. Amen. I invite you to grab your red hymnals and flip to page 881. We'll share in our Apostles' Creed, which is one of the more uh, traditional and ancient ways for us to express our faith together. And we can see so much of that love of God, that present love that shines through in this affirmation as we tell the story of our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified.